How did I get here? Short answer, passion perpetuates purpose. Longer answer, we have to rewind the clock. Over 12 years ago, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's the spring of 2006, and I had just completed my first high school football combine at the Don Hutton Center, the Green Bay Packers training facility. And on my way out, on the tables as you were leaving, there were sign-up sheets and waivers for an even bigger combine to come in the weeks ahead. Now, it was made very clear on these sign-up sheets that this upcoming combine was for seniors to be. Keep in mind, uh, I had just finished my freshman year of high school. So I had no business attending this camp in particular. But something told me I had to go. So I grabbed a sheet, I signed up, and I went. Little did I know, that moment would change my life forever. Because at that camp, I still remember it like it was yesterday, at Wausau West High School, I met three individuals. Tom Shaw, Matt James, and Chris Gizzy. Tom, Sh Tom Shaw, T. Shaw, as we call him, is now the head strength and conditioning coach for the Oakland Raiders. Matt James still serves in the same capacity as the day I met him, which is the head of the Nike Football Combine training circuit. And Chris Gizzy, or Gizzy, as we call him, is now second in command on the Green Bay Packers uh, strength and conditioning staff. These three individuals were extremely good to me that day. Talking to me between drills, making sure that I was having a more than positive experience. But they didn't stop there. After the camp had concluded, we exchanged information. I got their phone numbers and their emails. Must have been not even a week later. I hear a knock at my door and I come upstairs and I find a package at my doorstep. And this isn't just any package. It's a 30 pound box filled with anything and everything Spark, we all remember Spark, right? Speed, power, agility, reaction, quickness. Anything Spark had out in the market was in that box. Things that I still use today in my facility. Cones, hurdles, parachutes, ladders, you name it. If Spark had it out there, like I said, it was in that box. And there was a handwritten letter by all three of these guys in there as well. And so, you can imagine the impact this had on a 14-year-old boy. Now, some of you may or may not know this, but at 14, I had just lost my father less than a year ago. So I was extremely, extremely impacted by their kindness. And so I asked them, I said, why are you guys being so good to me. And without skipping a beat, they said, we are just here to pay it forward. And I didn't know it at that time, but I did know that that was the, the reason why <clears throat> this industry was for me. At that moment, I knew strength and conditioning was my path in life. No question. And as the years went on, that then became my purpose. Or my why, really. So I'd like to ask you, what is your why? Right? Why are you watching this presentation right now? Sure, it's to get better. It's to network, right? Maybe know me a little bit better. But I'm guessing that's all service level. There's something deeper there. 
right? Why did you get out of bed this morning? Right? The reason I got out of bed was to pay it forward. But it didn't stop there with these guys. It didn't stop there. In the summer of 2008, before my senior year of high school, I went down to Florida to train the tee shop at Disney's Wide World Sports Complex. I'm training alongside guys like Ike Taylor, James Ferrier, Tavares Jackson, Santonio Holmes, Darren Sharper, right? You can't make this shit up. Doing speed drills right alongside these guys. Right? So, pretty powerful stuff. 2008, senior year of football. I then went on to play college football at Grand Valley State University. Graduated there in 2013 with a bachelor's in exercise science. Would then go on to receive my master's from California University at Pennsylvania in exercise performance enhancement and injury prevention. Did some freelance training. Worked at a couple private sector facilities in West Michigan working mainly with adults and youth athletes. I left to go out on my own in January of 2016. Didn't know what I was going to do. Started traveling, trying to meet as many people as I could, learn from as many coaches as possible. And then I met the big dog. Yeah, we all know this guy, Big House Power, Coach Joe Kennedy of the Carolina Panthers. Coach Ken put out a post on Instagram, right? I remember it like it was yesterday, I was watching it with my girlfriend. And he was asking for the audience, right? The Instagram followers, to give him a reason why he should invite you or us to a seminar that he would hold at his house in Clemens, North Carolina. I mean, who does that, right? It's nuts. It's not nuts. That's Coach Ken for you there. So I, I left my comment. Thought, ah, well, we'll see. Well, he selected me to go to his house, right? So that's how I got to meet the big dog there. He gives me a nice kick in the ass every now and then in life when I need it. At his house, I also met my business coach to date, Andy McCloy, another guy who continues to pay it forward for me, helping me level up in life ever since I met him that day. Fast forward a few months, I met another familiar face we all probably recognize, Mike Robertson at the Physical Preparation Summit in 2016. Mike didn't stop there. He also, he also used his platform to selflessly elevate me, right, by having me on his podcast. At, this, at his seminar, I met this guy. Now, if we don't know who this guy is, you need to do your homework. It's Derek Hansen. He's my speed coach. He writes my speed programs. Right? This guy turned squat, bench, dead into sprint or die. I met Derek at that conference in 2016. Sat him down. Laid out my program. Everything. How we train the college athlete, American football, middle school, you name it, we talked about it, top to bottom, soup to nuts. Derek ignited a fire in me <clears throat> that has yet to be extinguished, right? When I met Derek, I was a 280 pound power lifter who called myself a speed coach. Let me say that again. I was a 280 pound power lifter who called himself a speed coach, 
right? I was a living contradiction, right? It's, it's kind of like jumbo shrimp. It doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, I was the guy that went to the grocery store and on my way out, I was now the proud owner of aisle four, okay? Derek uncovered my passion for me. My passion is speed, right? I love it. Cannot get enough of it. We've all seen the previews or maybe you've seen the actual movie Venom right now, right? All you superhero buffs. What is Venom? Right? It's, a, it's a symbiote, right? There's a host, has a symbiotic relationship. That for me is speed. I have a symbiotic relationship with speed. It's got a hold of me and it's not letting go. I'm totally cool with it. Another question for you. How do you know what you're passionate about? Hmm? I can tell you that the word passion literally means to suffer. Why do you think the movie is called The Passion of the Christ? You love something so much, you're willing to suffer for it. For me, that is speed. I can't tell you how many torn hamstrings I've had over the past year, right? I can tell you my right calf is now deformed. I can tell you that my pubic symphys is, is detached. But it's all good. It's my passion. Right? It's all good. And for me, my passion perpetuates my purpose. Right? Speed is the vehicle that I use to pay it forward, to leave a lasting impact on those I serve. Passion perpetuates purpose. So, here's my promise to you. 45 minutes from now, you will have the tools that will make game-breaking athletes. No question, will make people faster. But, it also has the potential to change lives. And one life I want to talk to you today about is Ellery. This little girl has my heart. I met Ellery over a year ago. She was 12 years old. She had never been involved in any sort of formal training. She's a two-sport athlete. We're working on a third, trust me. You should see the way she runs. We're trying to push her to track. Right? Two sport athlete right now in volleyball basketball. Unlimited amount of potential this young lady has. She passes the eyeball test with flying colors. But she's unsure of what her thing is. That's what her mom told me verbatim. She doesn't know what her thing is. Right? But she did know she wanted to become a well rounded athlete. Okay? But she had a problem, a few complications, right? She's a middle school girl. Now, aside from everything going on with her anatomy during this time, middle school girls are mean to each other, right? That's a fact, 100% fact. Her coaches demands and expectations. So she has some villains in this story, her coach being one of them. I met the guy. Now, this might come as a shock, but not every single guy who used to play in the NFL is a nice guy. I'm just going to be straight with you. This guy's a douchebag. Okay? So her coach is a dick. Even her teammates see more playing time than her. Right? Her opposition being better than her. So you can imagine what all these villains in complications 
are doing to her confidence. Right? Her confidence level is at her feet. Right? It's effectively zero. She doesn't deserve this. That's my belief. Life's too short to impact an individual in a negative way by way of sports. Right? It's a game, for crying out loud. She doesn't deserve this. So how do we help her? What can we do? Well, the resolution, her resolution, is a three piece of speed. Okay? If you're watching this video, you have an Ellery in your life. Have or had at some point. Better yet, you have been in her shoes. We have been in her shoes. We feel her pain. We can empathize with her. Right? We know where she's been. We've been in her shoes. Now, disclaimer. Everything you see in the upcoming slides, drill-wise, programming-wise, X's and O's, okay? I wouldn't be surprised if, if you have seen all these things before. But my goal is not to baffle you with bullshit. I want to empower you with the essentials, okay? I am boring, I am vanilla, and I am basic. But you know what? The basics are the basics for a reason because they work. Not that that's out of the way. So why is that we want speed? Right? How can speed help her? This is a quote by Hank Krajinov. Pretty smart dude. Right? Speed is the most universal sport of all in that it forms a foundation for many other sports and where getting there first is important. Hmm. We've all heard it before. Speed kills. You've all probably heard of this dude. He's been coaching like what, 50, 60 years? Al Vermeil in his hierarchy of athletic development. There's a reason why speed sits at the top. It is the ultimate performance enhancer. It separates the poor from the average, the average from the good, and the good from the great, period, dot, amen. I will not budge on that. So let's get into it. The first P is posture. Okay? If you look up what posture means on the Googles, it's a position in which the body is standing. Right? Simple enough. So what's the goal of posture? Well, we want to create comfort and ease while in motion. Okay? Why is it important? Bill Hartman once said, breathing dictates posture, posture dictates performance. I thought that was pretty profound. So I just took half of that and threw it whoop, right up there. Thank you, Bill. Posture dictates performance. If we don't have good posture when sprinting, forget everything else, nothing else matters. Okay? A few different errors you might find during posture, okay? We'll have excessive forward lean or trying to stay low when sprinting. We'll have a trunk flexion or like a C, looking like a C in the thorax there, okay? And then lastly, we'll have premature or overextension, all right? So, some drills. Again, I'm sure we've all seen a lot of these before. So we have acceleration posture holds. All I told Ellery to do was get two steps away from the wall, put her hands at shoulder height, 
And as far as getting her leg up, all I'm saying to her is I want you to smash your right calf into your hamstring. I'd like you to get her knee just a little bit higher there. Oh, there it goes. Look at that. How's that for coaching? So we'll hold this for anywhere between 20 and 30 seconds, two to three sets. This is level one for acceleration wall posture. Okay, so we were static. We weren't moving at all. Now we're gonna start moving a little bit, okay? With down ups. So what I'm looking for here out of Ellery is for her to maintain this neutrality, if you will, or straight line from her ears to her hips while becoming a little bit more dynamic, moving in and out of some deeper angles here. I'll say down, she slides on the wall, and up, she pops right back up to where she was. Down, up. Down, up. Again, just looking for her to keep that nice and neutral posture, moving in and out of deeper angles there. Slightly more dynamic environment. Okay, this one, marching, marching. Big thing I'm trying to ingrain here with Ellery is rhythm and relaxation. What I'll always tell the kids is if I were to build a wall from your hips down and all I could see is your upper body, it should look as though you're doing nothing. That's the level of relaxation I'm looking for. Oh, relax. We'll do anywhere between two, two sets. You can do 20 seconds to 30 seconds a set. Okay, so now we're moving, starting, you can see we're starting to move a little bit faster now. These are just simply called singles. I want to say switch or hit. Okay, and we're just simply switching the knee that is up as quickly as possible. Okay, when working with a pusher or a puller, don't get stubborn, don't get stubborn, right? If I'm working with somebody who, who, who is a little bit more front side or reactive, I might say, imagine there's a plane of glass, and then when I say switch, I want you to break the glass with your down knee, right? If I'm working with somebody who is a little bit weaker or is a little bit more uh, prone to backside cueing, I might say, I want you to smash the footprint behind you with the up foot, okay? Knee up just a little bit higher, Al. Switch. Switch. Ellery's doing a good job keeping Switch. her posture. Switch. Switch. Touch in. Switch. 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 And relax. We'll then go to doubles. It's just what it sounds like. Instead of one switch, we're doing two. Okay? So, common error you'll find here is that the kids or your athletes will shorten their first switch, almost as if they're chasing the up leg, right? You want to make sure that they're getting two hard, full um, <clears throat> range of motion switches with each leg. Switch. She does a good job Switch. here, getting both knees up Switch. high. Switch. 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 Good. So you can see a trend now what's happening with the posture as far as acceleration goes. Okay, we're, we, we, we were static, slowly starting to move, getting a little bit faster in our movements now, right? Almost as, almost as if it's resembling running somewhat. Now, the band, you can see there's a band around Ellery's hips here, okay? This can be used for either a corrective means or simply a form of overload, okay? Great for corrective means because the athlete can feel the band around her waist, which allows her to then push her hips towards the wall 
to be in greater alignment from head to from head to toe, head to heel there. Okay. Or if you just want to spice things up a bit and challenge somebody who has good posture, you can throw a banner on them too there, right? Then you can just work the entire sequence again with posture holds, down ups, marching. Singles. And doubles as well. Alright, so now, now that we've covered acceleration posture, the next piece is max velocity posture. Right? So uh, acceleration, we have a little bit more forward lean. Once we, the athlete hits, hits max velocity, they're much more upright. So, we'll get arms length away from the wall, hand right, hand right in line with the shoulder. I'm telling Ellery to feel all of her outside foot. And if I were to press my hand on top of her head, she should be staying up tall into it. Make sure, make, making sure she's staying tall and staying big. For this first rep, or this first um, exercise, it's the same cue I use for the acceleration and posture hold, which is smash your right calf into your right hamstring. And we're going to hold statically here for anywhere between 20 and 30 seconds. I love these static positions because you can correct mid-rep. And what does that do? That instantly makes Ellery a good student and you a good teacher. It's a win-win. Now, as far as teaching the strike, the foot strike, I use a part hole approach. Okay, so we're going to break it down, and we're then we're going to put the whole thing together at the end. All right, so I'm going to give Ellery three commands here: down, back, recover. Down, back, recover. Down, back recover. Down, back, recover. Down, back. You can see Ellery's doing a really good job of not getting egregious in her backside mechanics. What I told Ellery is to imagine that she's in a phone booth. Amazing kids know what phone booths are these days, but hey, it worked. All right, that's a win. So, she's standing in a phone booth, so she's not getting crazy in her backside mechanics. All right. Now, I want to be proactive here, because this is a question I always receive, is, Hunter, why do you have the kids with their heel out in front of them when the down come in? And the reason for that is, most people, or athletes, right, we're going to land somewhere between six and eight inches in front of our center of mass when sprinting at max velocity, right? So my foot's down here, then it has my and then that's where my foot will make contact on the ground. My center of mass will pass over it. And I'm into the next leg recovery phase there. Okay? So that's my why for that. Down, back, recover. Boom. So now we've gone from three steps to, to two steps. So instead of down, back, recover, now it's just down, recover. Right? All I'm telling Ellery to do this time is just light a match. Light a match. I should hear a nice crisp tick on the turf as she passes by there. Down, recover. And then lastly, the dynamic cycle. Okay? All I'm going to say now is hit or go. And I'm just cueing her to snap her shoelaces under her with yesterday's urgency, right? So I might say, hey, Ellery, I need your shoelaces under your butt yesterday, okay? Go, 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 go. Doing a great job just flicking the ground here. Charlie Francis had a great, 
great analogy as far as ground contact time at max velocity. What Charlie said was, if I were to flip a bicycle upside down, okay, and to get the wheels, or the wheel rather, going fast, what would I do? I'd grab a whole bunch of tread, right, and pull it back and down, right? Pull it, pull it, lots of tread at a time. But once it's going fast, how do you keep it going fast, right? Wham! Just flick it, flick it, flick it, flick it. Ellery's flicking on the ground here, right? That's ground contact on a max velocity. Go, go. Just flick on the ground. Then you can do the whole thing over again, as far as the max velocity posture sequence is concerned, with the band around the waist, again, as a corrective or a form of overload. Your choice. The better the athlete, you can start to oscillate the band, as you can see I'm doing there. The band's going up, down, all over the place, creating a little bit more chaos. Down, back, recover. Down, recover, all right? She just lighting the match, got a girl, good job. And then finally finishing with the dynamic cycle there. Now let's say the wall isn't accessible to you or it isn't economical, you've got a huge group and you only got a little bit of wall space. Or just call a spade a spade. Sometimes the wall hurts people's wrists. Right? Just put the kids on the ground. Right? This is a great means here. As Buddy Morris told me, the body no longer has to seek stability once on the ground. Right? What are you going to do? Fall? You're already on the fucking ground. Okay? So all I'll tell Ellery here is calf smash, step toe over a knee. Or just one, two. One, two. You can do anywhere between 10 and 20 reps, you know, two sets per leg. Calf smash, step to over knee. Calf smash, step to over knee. Smooth, comfortable, easy. Okay? But, posture is 100% necessary, don't get me wrong. We've laid the foundation, right? But posture alone is not sufficient. Passion perpetuates purpose. Ellery needs more. We gotta help her out with some more stuff, okay? What do we do? Second P, pattern, all right? What is pattern? It's a repeatable sequence in events or objects, okay? What is the goal? Well, we're looking at proper limb mechanics, right? Elasticity and turnover or frequency, okay? Why is pattern important? Well, touches on all the said goals that is touched on, right? But it also serves as the warm-up, right? The warm-up, the warm-up, the warm-up. I think today, with all the beautification of the warm-ups, it's just mind-numbing. I mean, who, what, like, what is being accomplished at this point, right? Other than your own ego being stroked, right? I've done that. Right? I'm going to do all these wonderful, cool yoga crawling patterns. Right? These ground-based sustaining, these simple to complex movements. Okay? All I'm trying to do is to get my kids to do something amazing on that day. And that something amazing is running fast. So if it isn't, if the warm-up isn't getting you ready to do that, why are you doing it? Hmm? So it's your warm-up. 
It's your warm-up. How will it be measured? How will it be measured? Well, we're going to use mock drills. Okay? We're going to use mock drills. They're as timeless as they are effective. Right? Some errors. Poor limb mechanics, lack of knee drive and arm lift, and poor elasticity, elasticity and reactivity. Okay? So, I like these arm action drills. All I'll tell Ellery here is I want her in a quarter squat stance, feet shoulder width apart, and I want a, um, a toe to heel relationship with her feet there. Arms in line with her belly button just, outside, just in front of her there. And if her right leg is behind, I want her right arm shooting up here, okay? Or her left arm, rather. And all I'll tell her is just up. That's all I'm saying is up, up, up. Up. Just throw your left arm up, Elle. That's all. Up. Up. I'm not even worrying about the back arm. It'll take care of itself, right? It's physics. It's physics. So you can see in these, in this, 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 along with a few other images, is taken from my friend Derek Hansen. Okay. So you can see that weak or poor arm mechanics, all right, really doesn't do us a whole lot of good, right? Conversely, good arm action cleans a lot of things up, right? Not only does arm action help us clean things up posture-wise, but arm action, the arm action is needed to literally counterbalance the force produced by the legs. Okay? Furthermore, the arms tell a story, do they not? Right? I don't even need to see what's going on below if I see the arms, right? If an athlete has shitty arm action, I know the legs look like crap too. Right? On the other hand, everything looks good up top. I know everything is down below is going great. Arms, arms, arms. Okay, another great drill here. Seed arm action. It does two things. One, promotes upper body relaxation as speed increases. Okay, and then two, I want you to see, I want to see if you can guess what the second benefit of this drill is. Okay, so walking, okay, she's jogging, and then she's sprinting. Look what happens to her hips. Okay, Ellery is walking, she's jogging, look what happens to her hips when she sprints. And she's sprinting. Yeah, the kiddo's having a good time. Really got a smile. So, you can see, let's play this one again. So we're getting some, she has the same composure as we proceed from walking to jogging to sprinting. That's a win. And then the hips, again. Upper body relaxation. Win, 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 win. Her hips are literally coming off of the ground. So what does that tell us? The faster my arms move, the higher my hips come off of the floor, right? The greater vertical hip displacement, which then allows my legs to cycle under me more freely. That's a win. Hey, March, knees only. You'll see with all these mock drills, we always will go stationary first. And the reason why we go stationary first, other than for the athlete to get it down, get the drill down before going forward, we like to go stationary because it's pretty hard to, to not strike right under your center of mass when you're staying still, okay? So uh, I think the only cue I'm giving Ellery right now is just lift, right? No sexy cueing, 
No fancy stuff. Just lift. Now we'll bring the arms in. What do you think this cue is? Lift. Maybe up and down, right, with the arms. Keep it simple. Okay, we'll march and then we'll skip. We'll skip. Up and down, up and down, L, up and down, up and down. Okay, then we'll get into our step over series. We'll get into our step over series. So once we hit on all the arm stuff, all the marching, all the skipping, all right? We don't just go right into um, Ryan A's or the more traditional high knees, okay? We like to work up to it, all right? As I said, the arms will tell a story, okay? The lower the feet or the lower the hands, okay? Slower the speed, right? Just think about it, okay? When Ellery performs this drill, she's literally only clearing ankle height, okay? Moving pretty slow, a lot of force dispersion going on, right? Think about it. The arms tell a story. When a wide receiver wants to slow down and blow, what does he do? Ta -ta -ta -ta. There, right? Lots of force dispersion. Okay? So that's the way we progress it. We'll go from there to stepping over shins. So slightly higher amplitude, slightly higher hands, which means faster speed. Higher the hands, faster the speed. And then we'll get into our more traditional running A. Okay? So, as far as the cueing goes, for the ankle, you can tell the kids to step over the ankles. Or if you, if you want to focus more on the hands, keep your hands at your belly button. For the shin, you can, have them, you can tell them to step over their calf. Right? Split their shin. Or get their hands to chest height. For a running A or a high knee, I like to tell the story about being at the beach, right? You're in knee high water, I need you to step out of the water, right? Or if you want to cue in the hands, just tell the kids to get their hands to their eyes. Ellery's doing a good job there getting out of the water. Higher amplitude, faster speeds, simple stuff. The arms tell a story. You can then put it in an ascending fashion, right? This is a nice little hack if you're working in limited space or the weather's crappy, right? You can mimic somewhat, right? The start, the acceleration or transitional phase, and then max velocity in a small space. Ellery starting ankle step overs. Then over the shin, and then over the knee. Right? Kind of like how you would run at 10 meters, 20 meters, and 30 meters. Right? Hands get higher, hips get higher off the ground, higher amplitude underneath the hips. You can do a hard, easy, hard. So El Ellery's cooking for the first three meters, she kicks it back to 90% then returns it on for another 100% there for the last three meters. You can do easy, hard, easy too. Easy, hard, and then kick it back again. Again, you can band it. You can tether them to a rack. You can get them with a partner. You can do all the same sequence we just did with a band around the waist. Okay, I like this one mainly for corrective purposes. Why? Because now the athlete feels secure, right? She's taken out of threat. She feels safe now, right? She, can, she has a sense of support there with the band holding her. So we bring the whole thing back. 
marching, skipping, running A's, doing a good job there getting out of the water, hands to her eyes, look at that. This next series will go overhead. Overhead. This one I like purely for corrective purposes. Right? And getting a kid on day one, I might just put their hands over their head right away because I know they're going to do it wrong if I bring the arms in. Right? It's pretty hard to have bad posture or to not be straight up tall, right? With your hands over your head. Right? I might just tell the kids, bring your biceps to your ears. Right? How do you not stay tall, stay big with your arms over your head? Okay? It's pretty hard to do. That's why we do it. Okay? Okay, so we'll march, we'll skip, and we'll do high knees. All with the arms over the head. Okay? If that still doesn't work, you can put a load over someone's head, a light medicine ball. We even use two and a half pound plates with our middle school groups, right? Having them concentrate on pushing the weight over their head to make them make themselves lengthen out. Same stuff, same stuff, man. Simple, simple, simple. March, skip and high knees. Now you can do stuff like pop float skipping. Pop float skipping, right? So we're looking for minimal ground contact time, maximal vertical displacement. Okay? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an A skip, a little more oomph. Just thinking up, up, up. The only cue I'm giving L right now is up, up, up. Pop float. Now here I'm bragging. I'm just bragging and showing, showing off what L can do, okay? This, the single leg pop float skip, not everybody will get there. Not everybody will get there, okay? So don't hold your breath, okay? What I'm looking for here is stiffness with the down foot and elasticity or reactivity with the repeating leg, okay? She's only gonna do one side. Single leg pop float skip. It's not bad for a 13 year old, huh? We'll go in place and we'll go forwards. So, posture, right, laid the foundation. Joint mechanics, elasticity, frequency, right, having a high rate of turnover. All those things are crucial, but they're not enough to create change that we need, that Ellery wants, right? Passion perpetuates purpose. She needs more. She needs more. So, it's time to push, okay? But first, I gotta be real with you guys. I have a confession. I hate the word push, right? I detest it, actually. It invites the forebrain to be involved, okay? Sprinting is a hindbrain activity. There's little to no thinking going on. Why would we want the forebrain to get involved when the forebrain is really good for activities that are slow and analytical? Right? Why the hell would I want the forebrain involved right now? It's ridiculous. Right? It promotes excessive use of force into the ground. Right? As Derek has always told me, push is just a slow word that's long just by itself. Right? Just push. Right? Even the word is slow. It's insane. And push the backside cue, right? It's endorsing longer ground contact times, backside mechanics. But I also love push. 
right? I love it. Why? Day one, when somebody comes into the facility, they're probably moving slow anyways. That's why they came to see you, right? So I'm okay with the forebrain being involved early on for, to, for to get the technique down and proficiency of movement there, okay? Also, unless somebody is just next level, a world-class stud, day one when they come into your facility, they probably lack strength too. So the word push, right, will allow them to uh, exert some force into the ground and get them into the proper angles to apply force, right? And I'm in West Michigan. I don't have any hills. And I also don't have 15 sleds from my middle school groups, right? If I had those things, I wouldn't have to use the word push. I would just strap sleds to the kids and let them run, right? I don't have those things. Backside, like it or not, is still part of the equation, right? I'm a front side fanatic, right? I'm a front side guy, but you cannot have front side without backside, right? It's kind of like having a brain without a heart. You have to have both. And I love push because it works. It works, right? To get Ellery to go from A to B on day one, if I say push and she does, right, she goes, that's a win. That's a win, right? I'll swallow my pride. It's all good. So, push. What is the goal? This is easy. We want to run fast, right? No shit, right? Why is it important? Why is push important? Okay, another graph by Derek. Well, the ability to burst, surge, or accelerate is somewhat coveted, is it not? Right? Because you've achieved 70% of max velocity by your sixth stride. Right? Hmm. Seems kind of important. Right? There's also stride frequency and stride length that come into play. Okay? Four and a half strides per second, right? You're up to two and a half meters per stride, right? Now, I've heard rumblings that simply by increasing someone's stride frequency and stride length, that you get them, that, that's what makes somebody fast. I disagree with that. Stride frequency and stride length are byproducts of running fast, right? We mustn't confuse causation with correlation, okay? Ground contact time. Ground contact time. All right? Here's a problem I have with most coaches and practitioners in the industry. Not most, some. But I'll hear things on Instagram, right, or at conferences where coaches will say, well, we want to do things that promote longer ground contact times because that's what happens during the acceleration phase. Are you shitting me? What? By your, by your first step, your first step, you've already cut your ground contact time in half, right? The proof is in the pudding, folks. If you want to run fast, you do not want to be on the ground for a long period of time, right? What is the definition of acceleration? It is the phase in which each step is faster than the last. That does not happen by staying on the ground for longer periods of time. We good there? Okay. Simply by running faster, we touch on a lot of other things. A lot of other qualities are improved. You're going to get more powerful. You're going to get stronger. Right? The amount of force you exert in the ground at max velocity is far more than you're ever going to have on a bar during a squat or a deadlift. Right? You're going to improve other qualities as well. Things like agility, quickness, without having to actually do those things. 
right? Because you're moving so fast at max velocity, right? The higher you keep pushing your top speed, the easier all those cutting and change direction drills become because you're moving at such slower speed, right? And you can do it with all, all then you don't have to touch on them as much, right? And take care of all the wear and tear you get on your body from all the cutting. Sprinting addresses multiple planes, right? So at surface level, you might say, well, sprinting is purely sagittal. I would disagree. Sprinting also addresses the frontal plane because it allows you to shift from your right to your left leg. Does it not? Right? So a lot of other things benefit simply by running faster. We look at Charlie Francis' motor unit activation chart. Sprinting sits atop, right? Has more motor unit involvement than all of your Olympic movements, all your plyometrics, mess and ball throws, right? Delicate and squat don't even come close. Right? So by sprinting, one can expect their deadlift and squat to get better, right? If you're into that jazz. Speed is king. There's also this concept of the speed reserve, right? What is the speed reserve? You increase your maximum speed capabilities, and by doing so, you increase your submax velocity to be held for longer distances. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if we're watching NASCAR, Right? We're watching the Daytona 500. What is the top speed of a NASCAR these days? 250, 260 miles an hour? Right? But what is the speed at which they operate at? 120, 130? Well, how are they able to hold that speed for 500 miles? Because their engine, their top speed is so great that 120 is a joke to them. Right? A more human example. Dennis Cometo is the world record holder for the marathon. Okay? Dennis runs the marathon 26.2 miles in just over two hours. I mean, it's two hours and two minutes. But many don't know that Dennis's PR for the 100 meter dash is 10.6 seconds. Okay? That's fast. That's very fast. Right? So, he still has a big engine, which is why he's able to run at that submax speed, or for a higher submax speed, for a longer duration. Okay? So, even though Dennis is the world record holder for the marathon, he's still a sprinter in some sense. Right? So, if you can't run fast, don't even bother running for distance. How will it be measured? How will it be measured? Okay, well, we don't want ground contact to be in front or behind. We don't, I mean, we don't want poor extension through the ankles, knees, and hips. And we don't want this butt kicking action. Okay? Now, over the past year, year and a half of knee sprinting, myself, I've come up with this rule of three here. And perhaps it's not, perhaps it's not my rule. Maybe it's just an old idea that's been repackaged. Okay? But I've come up with short to long, soft to hard, and slow to fast. Short to long talks about tissue resiliency, okay? We can also run short, uh, relatively fast in day one. Short to long programs are awesome because strength plays the biggest role in acceleration. So just by keeping your effort short, right, 10 meters or less early on, you're gonna get the kids stronger, two. Two birds, right? <clears throat> and you can also lengthen out the acceleration phase, which is a good thing, okay? The more beautiful and long the acceleration phase is, the more powerful the max velocity phase, right? So short to long, keep your efforts, you know, 10 meters or less early on. I might even say with the kids, just give me three to four hard pushes, right? Might be like five or six yards early on. Soft to hard, soft to hard. So we're not going to break inertia. Right? We're going to do things like walk-in starts and falling starts, where the, the kids are constantly moving, right? and the only thing that changes is the velocity. Right? 
So we're going to be looking more at upright starts, right, which is beneficial for the lower leg. It's going to take all that stress off of the calf, the Achilles, stuff like that. Okay? I don't want Hillary to have a deformed right calf. That wouldn't be a good look, right? There's also slow to fast. Slow to fast. Slower speeds, all right, promote technical focus and ingrained relaxation, which is a very good thing, right? Because intermuscular coordination is key when sprinting, right? Charlie said it best. It's not how fast you can contract, you can con contract, it's how fast you can relax, right? I bet you right now, if you took your group of high schoolers, middle schoolers, or what have you, and you told them to run a rep at 90% instead of 100, you might find that a few of them PR. Why? Because relaxed muscles are efficient muscles. Short to long, soft to hard, slow to fast. Okay, so this, this is my progression from, of uh, soft to hard starts that we use with our kids. All right? So we have a normal walk-in start here. Ella will walk to the cone. She'll give me three or four hard pushes, and we'll call it a day. Boom. All right? She's constantly in motion. The only thing that's changing is the velocity. All right? There's no static overcome by ballistic. She's upright, minimal, if and minimal to no stress on her lower leg. We'll then go to falling starts. Feet shoulder width apart, quarter squat position, toe to heel relationship with her feet, both arms in front of her belly button. She's in a fall, and then just push away from the line there. Fall, push, push, push. Simple. Partner falling starts. Now get her into a little bit deeper position here. Not so deep that where she's scared, right? I want comfort, I want ease, right? Definitely don't want her to be afraid. I'll step out of her way and she'll just push away from that line. Getting good arm action, up, up, up. And off we go. Medicine ball push throw starts. So we're getting an upper body component in here as well. I like these ones because the ball will actually help us break inertia, right? And then, right, by releasing the ball out in front of us, everything's already out in front of us, so that all that Ellery has to do once the ball is released is just increase her rate of turnover with her arms. Use the ball to break inertia. Throw yourself into the sprint and just increase your arm action. Jump back starts. Jump back starts. Get a little bit more reactive now. Okay. So what I'll tell Ellery is here, here is I want her, when she jumps back, I want her feet behind the cone and her chest in front of it. Jump back. Boom. Push, push, push. Easy. Simple. Effective. Okay. So... We're, we've been moving now. This is truly a, little, a static start. Okay, we're getting closer to the ground. As we're getting closer to the ground, starts are getting a little bit, a little bit harder, right? A little bit more taxing to the lower leg. All right, this is the progression. She's using all of her strength in her lower body to push herself out of that position. Remember what I said, strength plays the biggest role in acceleration. Play that one again. Push. Kickstand starts. Ellery is not strong enough to do a full-blown push-up start right now. Okay, so instead of just being stubborn and not doing anything about that, I'll just bring the ground to her. Right? By having her put her foot out in front there as it serve as a kickstand to help her push off. Push. She is good enough to do these. All right, so I'll just segment it out for her now. Okay. Push, step, go. Break it down. Meet your athletes where they're at. 
Three point starts. Three point starts. Pretty simple setup here. All right, what Ellery's gonna do is she's gonna uh, get her knees on the line. Her feet are gonna be hip width apart. She's gonna drag her back foot to make sure she stays hip width apart. Put that knee in line with her ball of her foot. Both hands on the line. Hips up high because water rolls downhill. Cock back her arm, one, two, and out. Easy. Right, we're not hacking into the mainframe of the Pentagon here, guys. It's, it's a three point start. No need for some complex algorithm. Just put the kids in a position where, they are, where they're comfortable and they can let it rip, easy. Boom, see ya. All right, so that's mainly the acceleration stuff. If we're gonna introduce Anything max velocity wise with the kids, right? During the, during the summer months when we can go outside. I like flying starts because they ingrain relaxation. You can lengthen out the acceleration phase. And when you just tap max velocity for anywhere between 10 and 20 meters, right? It's only a second or two. The likelihood of injury is minimal, okay? So we're starting out with a falling start here. Ellery's building for 30 meters, taking her time here as she accelerates. Boom, and she turns on the gas for the last 10 meters there. It's not bad for a 13 year old, I'll take that. All right, so I have a progression with my soft to start accelerations. I also have a progression with my cueing, okay? So I'll say things like push. I'm starting from uh, with literally the feet, right? Push, right? Or I might say sweep the ground. Imagine we have brooms on our forearms, right? We're sweeping the ground, right? Feet push there, okay? I might run into a um, a foot placement issue, right? Where the kids will start casting, right? Or over striding and land heel first. Okay, I'll just tell them the story. They'll be like, well, when you drive, right? What does this look a lot like? Well, it looks like you're slamming the brakes, okay? Just that you, when you go, you're going nowhere. It just hurts, right? This is the gas, right here. Push down, 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 right? Those who can push the ground the hardest, go forward the fastest. You heard me say break the glass during the wall stuff, right? There's a plane of glass in front of you, break the glass with your knee there, okay? Start to move up the chain, right? Start at the feet, now we're at the knees, okay? Hammer the nail, right? Imagine the kids are holding hammers, right? They're hammering the nail. Lift the hammer, pound the nail. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Might say punch, punch. Right? And then lastly, where I want everybody to get to at one point is just thinking up. Up, up, up. That's it. Right? Because sprinting is a high brain activity, right? You shouldn't have time to think about much else than just up. That's not to say that anything else isn't happening. Right? That's not to say that all the force being put into the ground isn't happening, right? It is happening. It's just happening too fast for you to think about. Right? And it's also just a matter of logistics. Okay? The arms are close to the brain. Right? What I say, the arms tell a story. Right? The message up will reach the arms before it reaches the legs. Okay? Don't remember, remember what I said. If the arms look good, up, 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 you know the legs look good too. The arms tell a story, up, up, up. So when you have a progression of both your drills and your cues, right, you are literally predicting the future, right? You've created a system, right? Because in my mind, to know speed means you can make predictions about it. And you get stuff looking like that, right? 
being a hashtag, as Derek Hansen says, right? That's a pretty good picture for a 13 year old. I'll take that. So, planning now. Set your athletes up for success. Structuring a speed session. What does that look like? Okay. Well, we have our posture against the wall, right? Pattern with mock drills, and push any speed means you have there for the day. Now, once posture or the wall has been mastered, right? Once they've shown proficiency in the wall, don't feel that you need to keep beating a dead horse, right? Once they've gotten really good at the wall, the only thing that the wall is good for is hanging pictures, right? We've shown ways where we can challenge or address posture during the pattern series, did we not? Right, with all the overhead stuff, okay? Knowing what speed zone to attack. Okay, this is where I divert a little bit from Charlie's uh, charts here, just based on my, my rule of three, okay? So if you're looking at the start, you're doing walk-ins, fallings, acceleration, you look at the push step goes, the half kneelings, jump backs, and then max velocity morpher flying stuff there, okay? If anybody wants any slides, just feel free to DM me or email me, okay? Then your plan, okay? As far as loading blocks, all right? Just gonna let you know right now, this is my reality, right here. This is my reality, right? I need to maximize the mundane, okay? If I need to do walk-in starts for five or six weeks with the kids, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, right? Odds are they have, they're not going to perfect it in six weeks, right? What, what Jay DeMeo told me is, why would you change the clip if you still have bullets left, right? If you've done five, three, one, you know it is boring, but it works, right? But Hunter says, man, people will tell me, man, Hunter, isn't that boring? Isn't that boring for the kids? Gosh, it's got to be boring. You fill in the gaps with fun. That's how you make it fun. Okay? So if we do a flying 20 with a 20-meter build-in, we have at least a four-minute break. Okay? So if I'm working with middle school boys, we're talking about Fortnite. Period. Amen. If I'm working with Ellery and a bunch of middle school girls, we're talking about the, the coolest things to do with our hair. That's how you make it fun. Okay? Maximize the mundane. Okay? In season and off season training considerations. Okay? In season, I like to tap at least 60 meters of total volume in a session. Okay? Don't ask me where I got that number from, all right? That number just seems to work out best for us. 60 meters at least every single day, that works out well for us, okay? If you want to get real fancy, we're coaching in a more intimate environment, more one-on-one -on -one stuff, then you can do half the volume as you achieve in the off-season. So if you worked into 300 meters in the off-season, just hit 150 meters that day and you call it good, right? Off season, I want to push the maximum speed capabilities, and as well as the volume, as well as the volume there. Why would you not build your training program around a foundation of speed? Why wouldn't you? Right? We've talked about all the capabilities or the benefits that speed has with its trickle down effects. Right? Why wouldn't you? And so we've come to the end of Ellery's story today. This photo was taken a few weeks ago at my alma mater in Grand Valley State. Ellery is 13 years old. She's in eighth grade. She is being recruited by Grand Valley as a basketball player. She knows what her thing is, right? She wasn't sure what it was a year ago. She knows what her thing is now. She is a basketball player. She is winning. Right? And so now it's time for us to make a decision. Consider the impact you can have when passion perpetuates purpose 
And also consider the cost if you squander the opportunity. Right? So this is not about me. This is very much so about Ellery. I want you to hear the confidence she exudes, the smile she has on her face, because this was not there a year ago. Hey Hunter, I just got back from practice and I wanted to share my speech with you that I'm going to do for team leadership. Hello, my name is Ellery Baker and the following speech is about the biggest leader in my life. I consider Hunter Charneski to be a leader in my life. If you were able to meet Hunter, you would find the things that make Hunter so special. He takes his job seriously. He's my trainer. He helps me become the best version of myself. He does that by encouraging me, pushing me, and taking me to the next level in all of my sports. Hunter is one of my biggest influences. Knowing that I get to see Hunter two times a week makes me realize that I get to become a little stronger mentally and physically. Overall, going to Freak Factory and seeing Hunter has changed me drastically. So if you get the chance to meet or work with Hunter, make sure you take that opportunity because he will make your day and help you succeed in life and in, in sports. Thanks. See ya. I'm quoting Vernon Griffith here when I say this, but there are few things more powerful than a young woman who is comfortable, comfortable and confident in her own skin because it is that young woman who will go and change the world. And that is why we do what we do. Passion perpetuates purpose. Thank you.